Okay. Okay, so yeah, this is the southbound stop here. On your right, you have got the Hilton Hotel, which is built on the site of the world's first ever commercial wet dock, the remains of which are still beneath the Hilton Hotel to this day. And then to the left of us, you have got the Hilton Dock over here. The Hilton Dock is named after George Kelly, who is the shortest serving the Prime Minister. And he was beaten very recently by Liz Truss. So Liz Truss is now the shortest serving the Prime Minister. up until the other side of the road is reclaimed lands. The river used to flow to the other side of the road here. And um, this building is quite unusual because it's just a ventilation shaft for the Mersey Tunnel. So it's almost certainly the most beautiful ventilation shaft you will ever see in your entire lives. In fact, if you claim to have seen a more beautiful ventilation shaft, then I would like photographic evidence before I believe you. Uh, the buildings that are just here to the left as well, not the ventilation shaft but the one behind it and the other two are known collectively as the three graces so this is something you will see in lots of your tourist bump you know if you see like your little brochures and stuff at the title about the three graces nobody ever really called it the three graces till the 90s though so this is something that has been developed by the tourist trade we were always very appreciative of these three buildings but we never had a collective name at any point until very recently the building with the dome on top to the left of us is the Port of Liverpool building. The middle building is the Cunard building. And then the most recognisable building in the whole of Liverpool is the Liver buildings with the beds on top. Everything's going everywhere. We'll get there. It's the main uh, Now, just in front of us as we get to the top of the you can see statues of the Beatles. So there's some Beatles statues that have been there since 2015. To commemorate 50 years since the last time the Beatles played together in Liverpool, and beyond that is the ferry terminal. So that is where the ferry across the Mersey goes from, which was of course made famous by Jerry and the Pacemakers with their 1964 international number one hit, Ferry Across the Mersey. Now just in front of us, you've got the Museum of Liverpool, which is the history of the city in one place. Please go in there if you get a chance, because it's completely free to do. You're all right, right down there. Oh yeah, we have to turn round though, lady. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, it's just up here the stop because we can only really stop on one side of the road. It's the same as you get people on that at the bus stop themselves. As you go past, they get annoyed as if you've gone past them, but you're on the other side of the road. It's, it's a, I don't know. I suppose we could all make that mistake though. Maybe it's silly for right now. Uh, yeah, we're just coming into stop number two now, which is the ferry terminal stop. And we do have a few people who are probably absolutely fuming that we went past them a minute ago. Relieved to see us again now. And there's those Beatles statues. Are you going to have a photograph taken with them ladies downstairs? Enjoy. Yeah. Well, we don't stop that long. You'll probably have to get on the next one. Oh yeah, there is another seaship. See it there. That's the first time I've spotted. I hope that's only just got in. Otherwise, my powers of observation are absolutely awful. Cause... Yeah, yeah, I didn't notice it before. We had a big cruise ship in yesterday with mostly German <coughs> people on board called the Mein Schmidt Three. Uh, that was here. Uh, a lot, a lot of Germans. It was was it a posh one? Was it? Yeah, posh one. Uh... Oh, okay. Yeah, and it looks like, oh, there's one on the other side of the river as well. 
That's a bit weird, isn't it? Well, weirdly, I don't know if it's connected, although I imagine it probably is. But there was a big van that blocked our way eh, for ages before, and it had it was like an RAF recruitment centre. You know, like uh, you know, you must open it out, and, it, and they had the people there to try and get people on board to join the RAF. Um, so yeah, it's possible that it was something similar, something to do with them. Maybe they've got one over there. get to see them a bit more when we go along as well and of course that is very close to where the Isle of Man ferry stops as well so the Isle of Man ferry is usually there. Uh, this morning we had the Belfast ferry on the other side of the river so it's been quite action packed on the river Mersey today to tell you the truth more so than it usually is. Oh well, those ladies did manage to get back in time. Fast as lightning. You got the Beatles statues on your left, and then a little bit further along is the statue of Edward the Seventh. There, and Edward the Seventh was famous for loving uh, to have a seagull sat on his head, which is why he's depicted. Ah, oh, ruined it for me. <laughs> That's the first time a seagull has ever ruined that joke for me. Yeah, that must be the one that robbed the cheese pie off me last week. I think. Uh, so yeah, we're onwards we go. We're going to turn right now onto Brunswick, which is going between two of the three graces. On the right is the port of Liverpool. On the left is the Cunard, which doesn't belong to the Cunard shipping line anymore, but it did at one time. The upper floors of this building are now where the council mismanaged the city. And just in front of us here, on the other side of the road, you can see Jürgen's Bar. Jürgen. Bar, which is named after Jürgen Klopp, the manager of Liverpool Football Club, of course. As I say, we had mostly Germans on board yesterday, and they were. one of them was saying that they should have called it Klopps, because they refer to it more as Klopp than they do as Jürgen's, but uh, Klopp sounds a bit of a weird name for the place down go on. It's going down to get a pint on Klopps. Mm, sort of like it as well. Uh, but we will be out onto the dock road in just a moment. Uh, you have got a good view of at least one of the liver birds there to the left of us. So the liver birds are the big birds that are on top of the clock towers there. And they are the emblem of the city and have been the emblem of the city for hundreds and hundreds of years. They're part eagle, part cormorant. These particular liver birds were sculpted by a German, by the way, a called Karl Bartels. And the unusual thing about it, well, it's most unusual, but well, crown and glory of it is those liver birds of course and everyone loved them and then three years later the first world war broke out and the german nationals were interred during the first world war so as a result Carl Bartels who had only just made these beautiful birds for us was sent to a prison camp St. Nicholas, as well as being Santa Claus, was also the patron saint of sailors. So this is the old sailors church that you're looking at here. And it would have been where the water flowed right up to, but this is the first thing that many people would have saw if you come along the river Mersey. Now we are coming up to a stop for a World War II museum. Does anybody want the World War II museum? No? Okay, it's in this building on your right. Now there's a specific reason for it being in this building because this is the exchange build which has a secret bunker beneath it I mean it's not secret anymore because I've just told you about it, I don't know but uh, it was a secret bunker where they planned the Battle of the Atlantic one of the decisive campaigns of the Second World War and that is what they've made the museum out of so the museum is built into the old bunker now if you look into one of these windows just behind this stuff I've been noticing this the last few weeks they've got Christmas trees still up so I can only presume like a, a business must have folded around Christmas time and they've still got the trees left up. 
this is the old business district of town. In fact, it still is the business district of town that's been. Uh, Liverpool was an extremely wealthy city at one point, so our business district spread right out from here to stop number six, which is where the uh, museums and galleries are. That was all business. Whereas nowadays it's pretty much just this little area of the town that you have to make, so the businesses and things going on. If you look to your left though, you've got the exchange station here. Exchange station was one of our main train stations up until 1977 when it closed and was made into an office block. We're turning right now to head down Moorfields, which has a not so beautiful uh, This is this one on your left. I find this a very offensive building to take the street. There's just something particularly ugly about it. And also when you factor in that it's an underground platform, but you've got to go upstairs to get in a lift and then go underground, it just doesn't make any sense. And it does make sort of sense historically, because that little uh, walkway that you go up to to get into the train station was originally a part of a plan of making people walk above the streets in Liverpool. They thought it would be safer if we walked above the streets and they had this idea for what they called the skyways. They were supposed to link all around the city. Now these were poorly thought through really. And uh, one of the things that we noticed when they put some of them up is that they were obviously attractions for crime because you're up above the streets away from people, you know, you can be easily moved in a skyway. Uh, plus just people weeing in them and stuff like that as well became a problem. So we only ever built a few of them. There used to be one down by the Lima buildings that I can still remember being there in the, as late as the 90s, but most of them had long been pulled down by the time I was a kid. Now, when we get through these traffic lights, we'll go past Matthew Street in a minute, which is on the left-hand side. Matthew Street is where the Cabin Club is based. The Cabin Club is where the Beatles played 292 times. So it's down this little side street on your left now. You'll see a sign that says the cavern, but that's actually the cavern club. The cavern club is on the right hand side further down. You've also got Beatles statues above us now as well. This is a hard day night hotel, a Beatles themed hotel. There's Phil Harrison, my Philly family there. And then just in front of us you've got Liverpool One, which has been our main shopping area since 2008. 2008 was also the year we were made European capital of culture. We are a cultured bunch here in Liverpool. That's what everyone's always telling us. They say, you're a cultured bunch, you know? I used to think that's what they're saying, aren't they? Yeah, but we are coming around. It's okay. It's a low denomination. Uh, we are coming around to stop number four now. Does anybody want this stop? This is the shopping stop. Nobody for the shop? Thank you, though. At the top of the hill, Liverpool Castle used to be. But the castle was here from 1200 And it's still just to the left here, where they now have the Queen Victoria Monument. Queen Victoria has been here for well over 100 years now. Which is probably why she's got such a face on it. And you've also got the law courts over here. So bear in mind that with those law courts being there, a lot of these people hanging around are probably awaiting trial. Many of them are <coughs> We're turning right now onto Castle Street. This is the oldest bit of Liverpool here. This was just seven streets, Liverpool originally, and they were all in this area. And Castle Street is one of those original streets. And at the other end of this street, you can see the town hall there with the big dome on top. And the town hall is the second oldest building in Liverpool and dates back to 1754. It's a very old building. It's also where the Beatles stood on that balcony in 1964 when they came home for the premiere of A Hard Day's Night. They'd been away from Liverpool for some months and when they stood on that balcony waving, thousands gathered in the streets below, cheering and screaming. Now this footage is often used in documentaries just to show how crazy the Romania was. So yeah, you may well have seen that on the telly. Uh, does anybody want this stop? This is the closest we get to the cabin, but it's also right next to the slug of lettuce. Are you leaving us here, sir? Slug and lettuce it is. Remember, if you're getting a meal in the slug and lettuce, you get a free glass of bubbly if you show some sort of thing. How <coughs> oh, is it, right? I don't even know our own office here. Yeah, Come on, the heck, that sounds good. I wonder if I'm allowed to just get it just for being a guide. I don't know. I've often wondered that. Ooh. Is that with us? Alright, okay. Is there anything else we do? 
<laughs> Good stuff. Well, there you go, then. So there's quite a few things that you could do while you're in town today. Uh, we have got the William Gladstone pub just here on the right, which is named after the only Prime Minister to have been born in Liverpool. The only British Prime Minister to be born here. It was William Gladstone. Uh, now, the, as far as I'm aware, the building has got nothing to do with Gladstone other than the pub's used them's name. Uh, but later on in the tour, we do see the birthplace of Gladstone. Now, named after Queen Victoria, who was very fond of Liverpool. She was very fond of Edinburgh, and that made her an awful lot of money. And Liverpool did that. You can see some of the wealth that the city once had within it, reflected in these buildings around here. In fact, just after the traffic lights on the right, this building used to be the post office, which is just crazy considering how big it is. It was also a sword as well. On your left, we've got multiple buildings on the side of that building there. That is the St. Thomas Hotel which used to be the Bank of Liverpool. So Liverpool was so rich that we had our own bank at one point. And at one time we could even print our own money. Uh, there are people in Liverpool still printing their own money to this day. Uh, but that is a matter for the police. And, you know, one, I'm not going to be commenting on any further. So we're going to get through these traffic lights shortly, I hope. And we will pass between two hotels which are named after opposing footballing legends. And for football fans amongst you, we don't go out as far as the stadiums, none of the tours do, because it's just a little bit off the beaten track. It's not like a million miles away, but there's just a run where there wouldn't be much to talk about, basically. So, you know, we don't tend to go out to stadiums. We do pass these hotels, which are reminders of Liverpool's absolute obsession with the game of football. Uh, if you look to the left-hand side of the road, a bit further along after the traffic lights there, you can see a red brick building. And that is the Dixie Dean Hotel, which is named after an Everton Football Club player who scored 60 goals in a season. So Everton is a, a, an area in Liverpool and they have a football team named after them. And then on the right hand side of the road you have got the Shankly Hotel, which is named after Bill Shankly, the manager of Liverpool Football Club between 1959 and 1974. So as I say, uh, you can definitely get a feel for just how obsessed the people are with them. I mean, even if you just listen to the uh, conversations of men in the pubs, it would just be football this, football that, for hours on end. So coming up just in front of us, you can see the beautiful Victorian buildings on the street. The street is the left, as you can turn around here, you will see the first of two road tunnels that go underneath the River Mersey. And this one was designed by... Uh, what was his name? John Brodie. John Brodie designed this and he was at Liverpool's ch chief engineer. But John Brodie, who was a scouser who lived in Toxteth and designed, engineered this tunnel, was also the first person anywhere in the world to discover that if you put a net on the back of goalposts, you would not be going after the ball every time you score the goal. So he invented the football net as well as engineering the tunnel. He was a clever guy. He also came up with an early version of prefab house. It was a prefabricated house. He came up with some early version of that. If you look to your left now, you've got the museum. We're going to be on some bumpy ground here, so please hold tight. We've only lost 22 people this year so far. We don't want to lose anyone else. Uh, does anybody want this stock? This is the museum and gallery stock, and all of these beautiful buildings are free to enter. Anybody or nobody? Anybody? No? Okay. So that's the World Museum, then you've got the library, and a little bit further along you have the Walker Art Gallery, a great old Victorian art gallery that exhibits from all over the world and from all different eras. In front of us, on top of this column, is the Duke of Wellington. On top of the Duke of Wellington is a seagull. Now, Anne, the driver, Googled it for me before and found out that the statue was 25 feet tall. It's, it's a lot bigger than this horse, 25 feet. Um, the Heidelberg, which is some sort of horse, but it's 18 foot, is also bigger than this horse, so that must be massive.
1989 when 96 Liverpool footballs, 97 as it stands now, Liverpool football supporters were killed at the Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield in a massive crush uh, where the police had let too many people in and then spent about 20 years trying to blame the fans themselves. Here on your right is Dr Duncan's book. Dr Duncan was our first chief medical officer. He told the people of Liverpool to drink beer instead of water beer was distilled and therefore wouldn't carry cholera or typhoid or anything like that. There are people in Liverpool still taking Dr. Duncan's advice seriously to this day. What was that? As <laughs> frequently as possible, yeah, an apple a day, a beer a day. Uh, if you go in there though, it's a lovely little pub by the way, I, I do occasionally pop into the Dr. Duncan's pub, like it. Uh, on the left here is St. George's Hall. St. George's Hall is a beautiful build and it's one of the definitely top five most impressive buildings in the city. It's where the registry offices need to where people need to get married. But at one point this end was the law courts where people would be sentenced to life imprisonment. So it's almost as if not much changed. Um, but yet we will see these beautiful views of St. George's Hall over here. something to me there, huh? Oh, was it up here, was it? Is somebody want to leave us at Lime Street Station? Ah, is it a downstairs person? Oh, okay. <coughs> yeah, we go round the houses and then you get, you have to get off at the bottom of Lime Street on the other side though, so, so just uh, relax, hang tight, is that what you say, hang tight, hang loose? Hang loose, hang fire, hang fire. That might, that sounds right, yeah. Hang fire. <laughs> so on your left is St. George's Hall from 1854. It is a beautiful build designed by Harvey Longsdale Elm. Are you guys local? You are local. Now, a rumour, a myth about this build uh, has been going around for years in Liverpool that I definitely knew of growing up. And I hear uh, lots of scousers in the back of the telly when I'm on the bus, which is that it's a Street was built and then this is built just just under 20 years later and it is a very impressive building. It was used by Warner Brothers Film Company recently as Gotham City Municipal Hall in the Batman film. Lots of the ba recent Batman film was filmed in Liverpool so they used extensively London, Glasgow and Liverpool as Gotham City. It seems weird to think they would use American cities but um, they obviously have picked three places that can pass as American as an American city. So on your right you've got the Empire Theatre there, which is the last place the Beatles played together in Liverpool. That was back in 1965 on their 65-66 tour, which is the last tour they did. They've also got coming up in July, Titanic the Musical. I have no idea how that'll work. It's strange, won't it? Well you do know how I've finished. I mean I hope it goes down well. What was that, sorry? I know, oh yeah, I mean, yeah, I just thought I'd love to know. A little tiny bit of me is intrigued. I've never even watched the film, though. I've never watched, you know, the, the James Cameron film. I mean, I know the story. I don't, weirdly, I remember watching, I mean, obviously I'm not making light of the disaster itself, but there was, a few years back, a, a cruise ship that went down, I think, in Greece, maybe? And I remember reading an a, a, a eyewitness account where she said it was something like out of the film of the Titanic. And I thought, you mean it was like the Titanic? You know, it was like that was out of the film. There you go. Uh, but we are on London Road now, which is the old road to London. So this is where you used to begin your journey to the capital at one time. And there isn't much to talk about when you're on this little stretch now. You have to go around the house quite a little bit of Liverpool, so as a result it's harder to get the tour pushes around. But really we will still get back to the you know the constant beauty of the city. It's just that we have to go through this one bit. And this bit does have a lot of history. It's just there's not much to point at because between the 1950s and the very early 70s they 
cleared a lot of this area because there were slums. So this was a slum area of, of Liverpool. And the area to the left of us is Vauxhall, which is the only place outside of Ireland to have successfully voted in an Irish nationalist member of parliament, which seems absolutely bizarre to me, but it does go to show just how many Irish people were living in the area to the left of us. It's basically where my family are from, that area of town, uh, the North Liverpool area, and it was an, an Irish enclave, but obviously those Irish people spread out to the rest of the city as the years went by. And they do estimate that about 75% of Liverpool's population can trace itself back to Ireland. So as a result, the accent uh, sometimes will get mistaken for an Irish accent, not within the rest of the UK. The rest of the UK know the difference between an Irish accent and a Scouse accent, but uh, people from other countries will often mistake it, and they are picking up on something. You know, there is there is an element of that within the accent. We were a Lancashire town originally, so we would have had a Lancashire accent. It's a little bit like if you've heard of George Formby, the ukulele player. Uh, he's like, you know, like a sort of almost comic voice to a certain extent, that was like an accent. And then our accent is that, with a little bit of Irish and Welsh mixed in. So it's a, it's a, it's a big mishmash of accents, really. Uh, we do like a thing, which we almost certainly got off the Welsh. But we can't help but make K sounds without... You know, if you say we're going to docks, but you know, we're going to docks, but I'm going, you know, got to go to the bank. Uh, and it is almost certainly off the Welsh, that bit, because they were the second big demographic. We basically had a town that had, by the, ninth, by the 20th century, Irish, Welsh and English as the third demographic, basically. On your left here, you've got the Seymour Terrace, which are these beautiful Georgian houses. Uh, somebody told me that you can tell Georgian houses because of the, the way the windows are little up the top. Yeah, there's like a, you know, there's a pattern to it anyway. And later on in the film, we just see a whole area that is just streets and streets of housing like this, known as the Georgian Quarter. And they use that area to film lots of costume dramas. So, you know, lots of things. Anything set in the past will tend to be, have at least a few scenes filmed in the room. first train line, there were other train lines before this, but it's the first of what we would now know as an intercity line, so uh, the first of the modern railways basically. And this is the Lime Street stop that we're coming up to now. Does anybody want Lime Street? Yep. Well, I, I knew you wanted it, I was just seeing if anyone was doing it, yeah. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed yourself mate, have a good day, but whatever it is you're doing now, are you getting on a train? Get yourself on one of those trains. See you in a bit, mate. station itself. Uh, the first person to be killed by a passenger train was a local MP called William Muskerson, who managed to get in the way of George Stevenson rocking the first day that it went anywhere. He was an extremely unfortunate man. He was already quite an unfortunate man, though, because during his life he'd managed to break the same arm on seven different occasions. And also, on his wedding day, a horse fell on him. So, you know, he was somebody who should have kept away from the world's first steam-powered passenger line, I think. This is Lime Street just in front of us, which was made famous by a sea shanty sung by sailors all over the world, which had the lines Maggie May. They've taken her away and she'll never walk down Lime Street anymore. Uh, she was a lady of the night who was said to have robbed the boots of her clients, and for that she was sent to Australia. So Lime Street at one point was the red light district of Liverpool. We're going back a long time, I'm pretty sure. Although even when I was a kid, it was like a thing that you could you could annoy another pupil in the playground by suggesting you'd seen their mother on Lime Street. Uh, you know, I saw your ma on Lime Street and that'd be it, there'd be a big scrap there. So on the left, just at the end here, you've got the Vines, which is known as the Big House. 
Have you been in the big house? This pub, yeah. Uh, it, it's always been a lovely pub, but for many years it's been a lively pub, but that doesn't make the most of itself in the way it looks. But now, they've done the other way now, it's, it now looks beautiful and isn't quite as lively as it used to be. So, uh, but it's still worth going in to look at. It's a, it's a lovely little pub if you get a chance. Uh, and if you're looking for lively pubs, and I suppose when I say lively, I'm, I'm sort of using that as a term for, for like the crazy pubs where everyone's just going a bit mental. Uh, they're all down here on the right. So like there's lots of them at Irish bars. Uh, they, so they tried to give it a name. They've, they've tried a couple of things. They call it, I think I've heard it known, called as the Irish Quarter. And I've also heard it called the top, top end of the town or the top of town. And so yeah, you just go around there and they've got like smoky moans and all those crazy places. Like, you go with all of them, yeah. But you get people like from 18 to 88 in there, don't you? You know, it's a, it's a massive wide range range that you see like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lewis's department store. Does anybody want the Adelphi Hotel, by the way? No? <laughs> this is the Adelphi Hotel on your left. That's the third Adelphi stand on the exact same spot. So it was one of the ones in New York, the one point Liverpool because you would get your ship out to America from here as well so the rich and powerful would stay overnight in the Adelphi Hotel and get themselves a ship in the morning. Now um, Liverpool had about nine million people emigrate through its you know docks out to America which is a phenomenal amount and even more than Southampton and yet when you speak to Americans a lot of the time they will presume their families passed through Southampton and it's sort of become in their heads like the more obvious place I think largely because that's where the Titanic went from, so, you know, people just have it in their heads that that must be where all the ships went from. But Liverpool was the major port, really. So we are now on Brownlow Hill, and we're heading up into the main student campus area of Liverpool. There are between 60 and 70,000 students in the city at any one time. And we have a population of less than half a million so as you can imagine, that many students turning up makes an awful lot to our economy. There are bars in town that survive on the streets and students alone. So it's not just rude, but it's fine. It's just a little bit of a Original building of the University of Liverpool. So this is the original red brick, as it says here on the scaffold, the original red brick. Because in Britain we use the term red brick to mean it being like a sort of fancy university that isn't one of the main two, so it's not you know Oxford or Cambridge. They have the, the Russell group of universities, and this is one of them here, and it's the first one to use that term, you know, it's a red brick. Although Birmingham also claims to be the first red brick as well. Uh, so I don't know who's selling the shoes, but I suspect it does. Yeah, it's definitely got to be a little bit. But yeah, there's a museum in here when it's open. It's closed at the moment because they're doing lots of work on it. But they have an amazing exhibit in there of the history of false teeth. So if anybody's interested in the history of false teeth, that's the place for you. <laughs> it's a dentistry museum there, I should, I should explain. <laughs> well, we're coming up to the Catholic Cathedral stop now if anyone wants it. Yeah. Okay, and there's people leaving us for the Catholic Cathedral.
you all okay down there? Calm yourselves down. <laughs> okay, so see you soon. Enjoy yourselves. Have a good day. Oh, there's a lot of you leaving. See you later. Thank you. Uh, yeah, every half, every half. Uh, the last bus out of the dock is ten to four. Okay. So the cathedral itself is known as the Metropolitan Cathedral of Christ the King, Liverpool. Although locally it's known as Paddy's Wigwam. And that's because it looks a bit like a wigwam, and because of the large Irish population in the city, of course. You can see the stained glass up the top, and when the sun shines through that stained glass. It creates like a kaleidoscope of colour inside, so it's well worth going in and looking at that. You do get a lot of people who don't particularly like it. Now, I do, you know, when I was a kid, I thought it looked like a spaceship, so I used to look, yeah, imagine it shooting off into space. Yeah, it is, it's amazing. And it, it, occasionally, you will hear people calling it the Pope's launch pad as well, so, you know, obviously a reference to it being like a, like a spaceship. The... Pope did visit in 1982, he probably visited other times as well, but I remember 82 because I must have been about four or five. It's one of my earliest memories is the crowds for the Pope. And he came and visited both this cathedral and the other one, weirdly, even though it's not his denomination. He made a point of visiting both of them. Yeah, that's the Catholic Cathedral. I can tell you all this, you know. You don't know where they're going. We'll get there in the end. So when you're back, you can see these. It's Bell Tower just here. Now that Bell Tower is there because if the bells were to ring inside, they would shatter all that glass. There's too much glass in one place. Now before I got interrupted then, I was going to say that even if you don't like the outside of it, then please still visit the inside because it's free to go in. So it's, you know, worth a punt. But also, it is, I think, probably much more stunning inside than it is outside. We're going to go left now onto Hope Street. And this next stop is the Philharmonic Dining Rooms, where you get a free pass of coffee. Which I'm the bus. Does anybody want the Philharmonic Dining Rooms? No? Okay, no. I'll show you it, though. Just go up here on the right hand side. famous for its urinals. The urinals in the men's toilets in here are the original Victorian urinals made from a very special and very rare marble. Tourists come from all over the world to take photographs of the urinals in there, which can be awkward if you're using them at the time. Uh, we are an equal opportunity city in Liverpool, so if any ladies would like to visit the urinals, you simply have to ask a member of staff to escort them in to make sure that no gentlemen are using them at the time. Now in 2018, Paul McCartney performed in this pub as part of James Corden's Carpool Karaoke. But in the last couple of days, they've been using the inside of this for a Brian Epstein film. Now Brian Epstein is the manager of the movie. Now they filmed this about two years ago, most of it. Um, which is weird because they were back doing like, I presume they do like the, the bits where they need to add a few bits. But it's, it's a long time between shoots. And I was thinking, Continuity errors in that, like, you know, yeah, you'll see, like, a fella, you know, you'll, one minute they'll have a shot of him, he's, like, 18, and the next thing you know, he'll look at like 23, and he's, he's gone dead flat. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. What was that? Yeah. But it's called the Midas Man, if you want to check out those uh, possible continuity errors. As I say, they were only filming it again the other day, so, you know, you've got to, it could be a while before it ever comes out. But yeah, so this is the Philharmonic Dining Rooms. It is known mostly for its toilets, but it is also a great pub. There's lots of stuff going on in there. It's a uh, you know, very ornate pub. This guy is called Hugh Style Brown, and I really don't know who he is, other than having read the statue, really, and picking up a little bit from other people, because he's not that big a figure, really. It, the statue, as it explains there, used to be somewhere else. And basically, I think they've been knocking down wherever it was, and we've just put it there instead. The story goes, though, that he was very much in favour of banning alcohol, which is funny that they've got the most from the 
most famous pub in Liverpool. But we are in the Georgian Quarter right now. And if you look to your left in a moment, you will see Faulkner Street. through time a few years back where it told you about everyone who'd ever lived at number 62 Faulkner Street. On your right in front of us is the College of Art, John Lennon attended, and next to it is the Institute for the Family and George Emerson both went to school. These buildings are now LIPA, which is the Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts. So this is an international stage school. Paul McCartney comes back most years to give out the certificates. Which is very nice of it's very nice man. And here we are coming up to Liverpool Angle Cathedral. Is this what you're looking for, ladies? Uh, you finally figured it out. There it is on your left, the Liverpool Angle Cathedral. Designed by Giles Gilbert Scott between 22 and 30. He lived to be 80 and then so he was Is anybody upstairs looking for this stuff? Or? Are you getting off here, are you? Okay. A couple of people leaving us here from upstairs as well, huh? Thank you. See you soon. So Giles Gilbert Scott, who designed the cathedral, also designed the red telephone box that we used to see all over Britain. It's the iconic red telephone box. Although somebody told me his original design was obviously just in black and white, he drew it, and it said next to it, it must be blue or silver. So obviously somebody <laughs> just decided, no, nope, we're going to make it red. But yeah, so this building, it is a pretty stunning building, really. And you can go inside for free if you wish to do so. So get yourselves in there and have a little look at that. And we'll have to have a word about uh, a little bit of training to get you to get them on. <laughs> they sounded like a battle, battle of fun, those guys, though, I have to say. <laughs> So yeah, the cathedral is stunning on a clear day from the top of the cathedral. You can see as far as the Taj Mahal, which is an Indian restaurant in Birkenhead. They do a lovely cheesy naan bread there if you get the chance. But we're going to turn right in a minute onto Rodney Street. Now, I don't watch Peaky Blinders, but if you do, uh, this is London in Peaky Blinders. Church, which is very close to Bowl Street. On your left, the Bondo Church itself, which is St. Luke's Church, 
but it was hit by a German incendiary device in the May Blitz of 1941. That device completely destroyed the inside of the church and left the outside completely unharmed. So this is just the shell of a church that you're looking at here. Left as a memorial to all those who lost their lives during the Blitz. Although, when we move forward, you'll be able to see that there's also a First World War Memorial on the lawn to the left of us as well. And you'll see that it depicts a German soldier and a British soldier shaking hands over a game of football. you've got what looks like, well, it is a secretary bird, I don't know what I said what it looks like. Somebody told me it was a secretary bird, and I'm not, you know, I don't know that much about birds, so that's what I, apparently it is. Uh, and it is on the side of the Wedding House, which is a sort of little department store that specialises solely in wedding gear. But it used to be the Bank of North and South Wales, so we did mention before that Liverpool has quite a bit of Welsh influence, and the Welsh are not far from here, you can see Wales on a clear day on the other side of the river, you can see the Welsh hills at the top of Mount Fana and places like that. But we're turning right now to head down Parliament Street into what they call the Baltic Triangle. This is where lots of Scandinavians live at one time. Nowadays it's where the over here on the left. I, I'm not sure if really what happened, but this used to have lots of like sort of out, outdoor dining bits, you know, places to have cocktails and that. And then about two months ago, they just knocked loads of them down. And, uh, the only thing I can say is that they seem to be rebuilt as well, so maybe they had some stuff on the top of the top of the top of the abbreviate everything here in Liverpool, so instead of calling it Lobscouse, we just called it Scouse, and the popularity of that dish led to us being known as Scousers, so we are named after a Scandinavian stew. There are lots of places around town that you can get yourself a bowl of Scouse, and Anya Driver has a pan of Scouse on the house at the moment, said that anyone is welcome back to Wales later for a bowl of it, didn't you, Anne? She wants you to bring your own wine back. Now the other side of the river is in Liverpool, by the way. Uh, the other side of the river is a small town. It's called Birkenhead, Wallace, New Brighton. Uh, that is the Whittle on the other side of the river. And you'll find that there is a very strange um, sort of break as soon as you get to this, to the river itself, basically. Because you can go about eight miles that way and you'll still encounter people who consider themselves to be scousers. And, you know, you'll still 
basically hear the Liverpool accent quite strong. But then you go one mile across the river there, and the accent softens quite a bit, or you know, definitely changes slightly, doesn't it? Um, and you know, you get people not is a woolly bag because uh, the kids you know obviously have just ran with it basically uh, but yeah so the, the woolly bag thing is meant to come from the St. Helens people who would come in to work on the docks would wear some sort of protective clothing on the back to stop the backs getting hurt and it would be like a wool based fleece um, now this though must be to because it's always used as a sort of derogatory term isn't it so this will almost certainly be a way of calling them a wind, won't it? You know, you know, look at them with the woolly bags. But actually when you think about it, it's quite clever to have a bit of protective clothing on your back. I mean, you definitely, you know, we should have all been woolly bags, is what I'm saying. Yeah, the kids have abbreviated it now, so it's called a... Super Cockney, you know, like some sort of amped up Cockney. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although I did, I met someone who was from, I think he was from South Africa, and he had a, he, but, he, but he had an almost what I would have thought was an Australian accent when I first heard him. Yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah. please go on TripAdvisor and remember that your guide's name was Matt and your driver's name was Anne. Although if you're complaining about us on TripAdvisor, then your guide's name was Keith and your driver's name was Olaf. Thank you very much ladies and gentlemen. Me and Anne will do one more tour and then that is the lot for the day. In fact, we're the last out, aren't we Anne? Yeah, we're the last out so there won't be anyone behind us either. Thank you very much everyone.